I'm excited to be here. It's my first time at your conference, so it's been a lot of fun. You're very welcoming. Thank you. Um, I'm talking about some work that's um, collaborative. One of the most uh, pleasurable things that happened in my 27 years of doing this kind of work has been the disappearance of, uni of borders, meaning that it's so much easier now to work um, with colleagues in Canada and the UK and so on. I mean, it really doesn't matter where you live anymore because we can share all our data on work on the same platforms and we're doing some marvelous things. And so our team, you know, I, I laugh because Gordon Broderick um, is on my team. He's from the University of Alberta, which is pretty darn far away from Miami. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like he's working next door. We, we, we work so closely together, it's really lovely. So I, I credit uh, Dr. Fletcher, Marion Fletcher, and Gordon Broderick with very much of what I'm about to present to you. Um, we do a host of, of studies down in Miami, and we've been at this for a long time. And so the group is interested in Gulf War illness, chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, and uh, a number of other things. And we're very interdisciplinary, and we have been from the very first day. What's well, one of the most, uh, I think, but the best things about our, the group we have is that we have immunology and nutrition and autonomics and uh, the CBT people and the, the secondary immunology people, which are very good people to work with, and, the, um, and then now systems biology and genomics. Uh, it just gets bigger and better. It's very exciting it's work that we're doing. Um, I'm going to have some Gulf War slides up here. So for those of you that don't know Gulf War, um, just so you know, the case definitions actually have tremendous crossover. So um, in our Gulf War studies, what we did to try to make things as clean as possible was we took um, Gulf War patients who also met the chronic fatigue syndrome case definition. And it wasn't very difficult. Almost everybody did. But it was very, very interesting to look at it that way. If you think we have case definition problems, wait till you talk to the Gulf War illness people. We, we, we look good. <laughs> uh, so I was asked to speak about biomarkers and specifically about immunologic biomarkers. I took a little latitude and, and drifted a wee bit in the course of this talk, but I don't think you'll be upset. So when you're using biomarkers, first you'd like to know, does a biomarker define the group? Can you tell chronic fatigue or ME or... Gulf War illness from other sick people and other well people. And that's a very important thing. Um, the next thing is, can it be used to define subgroups? You just heard Jonathan talk about defining subgroups using uh, genomic uh, methods. Very exciting, extremely exciting work to, to be looking in that fashion. But it also brings home the point, he found subgroups. So did the CDC's data set when, they, when it was um, queried for this type of thing using a different kind of genomic method. And I think most everyone else that's been looking at this group would clearly say that there isn't one homogeneous group, that we, we have a, a symptom-driven case definition. And so there's going to be subgroups. And the subgroups might be people that at this point in time, you've heard people, I've just spent the, the uh, lunch hour talking with some great folks from the UK, and you can hear people talking about how their illness has changed over time. So the subgroup might even be this is someone with a one-year duration illness or a 20-year duration illness. This is someone who's more predominantly autonomic today. And so these longitudinal studies also become really important in, in understanding what our biomarkers mean because they might actually define um, a population of how they are uh, at this point in their illness. Um, then for the sake of doing clinical trials, we desperately need biomarkers that define who's doing better and who's doing worse. It's awful hard to sell to the pharmaceutical industry, we're ready for clinical trials, by golly, if we don't have something we can measure beyond your symptoms to be able to say who's better and who's worse. It's very important. And then finally, oops, that dropped something off my last thing there. Um, pointing, the biomarkers sometimes can point to mechanisms of the illness, sometimes using a biomarker that defines who should have that intervention. I like using immune-based biomarkers to define people who would be reasonable to approach with immunomodulatory drugs. It would make sense. You know, if I'm going to try to treat someone for NK cell cytotoxic difficulties, wouldn't it be good to use NK cell function as who I define to have in that clinical trial? And that becomes my biomarker. It also becomes the thing I can measure for, for response to therapy. Did it improve? 
So we already have biomarkers. The moral of the story there is, when it's not what is the future, you know, when are we ever going to have a biomarker? We've been using biomarkers for a long, long time. The question is whether or not we have a biomarker that, that we will all embrace, that in a big, you know, group of scientists we won't all quibble about, but there are biomarkers. And the way to get there is better and better science with larger and larger groups. So when you look at mediators as biomarkers, what are the mediators of this illness? Why is someone ill? Well, we look at immune, inflammation, function, markers of, of immune um, status, neuroendocrine, you know, hormones. What are the hormones doing? Autonomic, boy, autonomics are a really big deal in this illness, and yet there are very few biomarkers that are, we're using right now to uh, define the autonomic overlay or the autonomic subpopulation. More recently, mitochondrial function, you heard Paul Cheney talk about energy in the cell today, and that's in part to do with, with mitochondrial function. Infectious agents, you'll, you'll be hearing the Whittemore Peterson Institute folks talking about XMRV and how exciting that is. You've heard about enteroviruses today, we've heard about um, Epstein-Barr, we've heard about HHV6 in past conferences, and they're all important. I mean, these are, these are infectious agents, and there may be others out there. In my world, people talk a lot about Lyme. What's the role of Lyme disease over in, um, depending on where Lyme happens to be? So there's still, still infectious agent discussions. And then pathways we're discovering by applying new techniques, and this is what Jonathan was speaking of. What does it mean to have a SNP in that gene? What was that gene coding for to begin with? You know, and what got broken when it, when it got a mutation? That can teach us so very much about what the cause of this illness is. And that's a lot of what our group and other groups are doing now, is trying to understand this through the genomic window. Because when he talked about 30,000 genes or a million SNPs, those numbers just sound huge. But you've got 30,000 genes out there coding for stuff that keeps you living, breathing, eating, feeling well, feeling poorly. And when we try to understand that, that's when we use a concept called systems biology. When we take these massive sets of data and look at what the genes actually code for, and then how they interplay, how strongly linked are they, and how, despair, how, how do they fall apart, how do those links fall apart in chronic fatigue or ME. And then we begin to understand the pathways, the actual pathways of how this illness is functioning right now. Why are you still sick today? It's one thing to talk about what was your risk, which actually SNPs can teach us a lot about risk. What, the, what was your risk? Why did you get ill to begin with? Why did one person get an enterovirus and get well, and then another person get an enterovirus and stay ill afterwards or get ill years later? That's risk. And then there's another thing about being ill right now. Okay, well, I got it. I'm sick now. Do something. Tell me, how did all these systems go bad? And what can I do to make them better? If you step back for a moment, you could talk about homeostasis then and say, my homeostasis set point right now, all these systems and all their interplays keep me balanced over here in this sick condition. And what I want to be is that person I was over here in my well condition, when all these different systems worked in a better, healthier fashion. And so some of the cool things genomics can teach us, and these are tools we just begin to have and understand, understand that we're right on the cutting edge with everyone else. We're not behind on this. We're with everyone else. Because as the tools are coming out, we're using them, we're applying them, and then we're using these very exciting methodologies to understand the data that we have in hand. So I am you know, one of the most rah-rah enthusiastic people about where the science is going. I think we're, we're moving along briskly and in the, exactly the right direction. So to come to ground for a moment, what you asked me to talk about today was immune biomarkers. And uh, so I, well, I'll do that. <laughs> That's what I do best. That's what I talk about all the time. So we have different markers. Some things are looking at immune activation, because one of the things that's happening in this illness is that the immune system's on button's been pushed on, and it's staying on, OK? And as a result, there is expression of activation markers, of cytokines that are involved, cytokines that actually cause illness, particularly these guys. And then there's also functional defects, functional defects that occur that allow um, some of this to happen, like the cytotoxic T cell and NK cell defects that we see and why they happen. We've, I mean, this is 20 years of work, 25 years of work, mapping out all the bits and pieces of how all this came to be broken. Um, and then other abnormalities in the system that would um, set someone up to be in a state where there's a cell that doesn't work, um, by chance it's the antiviral whole system, the, the NK cell, cytotoxic T cell, 
and so on, and, um, and then the state of immune activation. And I don't think it's a giant leap to suggest that in this setting, something would reactivate, say a virus, and turn the on button on and keep all this driving. And at some point, there's a, a vicious cycle. You know, I'm so overactivated that my cells just are depleted, they're not working well, and so more viruses can express. And so there's this sort of vicious cycle, this immune cascade of events. So we have, in a very methodical way, developed a study which we, we, we called the Good Day, Bad Day study in our, in our local recruitment material, and it seems to be the name now everyone takes it. Uh, but we've heard a lot today about how important it is to do longitudinal studies because some days you're feeling better and some days you're feeling worse. And from our point of view, we'd like to be able to develop the biomarker to use in clinical trials to say, oh, and when this is doing better, the patient's doing better. Now, there is already some data out there. We know, for instance, that natural killer cell function is a pretty good predictor of a good or a bad day, that people um, can improve their function and have clinical improvement, and when it falls, they tend to have a failure. And that's been published by, by several groups. Um, but we've been doing um, a very methodical look across many different potential biomarkers, most of them immunologic, and uh, trying to just decide, who, you know, is there anything that would predict uh, a chronic fatigue <coughs> patient and then a chronic fatigue patient sick or well, relatively well. Um, so this is just some early work that looked at, first this is a very inflammatory cytokine, IL-6. We talked about IL-6 over lunch with the guy that was asking about heavy metals. But the uh, IL-6 is a very inflammatory cytokine. It's one of a cascade of events that happens when you turn on the inflammatory system. And of course, here you can see in these chronic fatigue sample that it's higher than in um, the healthy controls. Now look at the ends in these studies. I'm going to point this out because one of the problems we've had with our studies all along have been that people are publishing, or in the historically published, relatively small studies at small numbers. And so, so you can imagine that the data is not as good as big numbers. When you saw Dr. Chia present ends of 336, I was going, wow. I mean, I was really impressed because you just don't see numbers in the hundreds in our literature. And sometimes they are the numbers that do that critical turning point that goes from, quote, controversial to dogma those big, big, big studies. And so we're trying to encourage all of, our, all of us and challenge ourselves to do the big and longitudinal types of studies that really say, no, this is not assay variation or selection bias or all the things that can be thrown at a small study. So these are not that, these, this isn't that well powered. This is 40 and 59, better than some. It's enough probably to publish, but not enough to turn a field on its, on its heels, you know. But when you start looking at bigger numbers, and now we have 150 chronic fatigue and 75 controls in four points of time with good and bad day, we can start really untangling some of these biomarker questions. I am only critical of my own data. You'll notice I'll only throw up my own slides and say, ooh, that was a bad study. <laughs> I wouldn't want to insult my pals. The, uh, so this is like a particularly good thing. Now, you saw earlier... Um, I think, Lenny, you showed an ROC curve. This is a, a curve that looks at, if this, if, the, if this assay was worthless, if it was just like normal controls, it would be on the green line. And the further it gets away from the green line, the better this would be as a biomarker. So we went through all of our cytokines, all of our soluble mediators, all of, you know, going through these, these types of curves, trying to just pick out. We just published this, actually, it comes out tomorrow, this, this slide in the literature. But the uh, cytokine um, curves in... Um, in our patient population, um, the pro-inflammatory cytokines turned out pretty good. Now, this is a type 2 cytokine. This is a, you're talking about type 2 shifting in, um, was it John's chart, Dr. Chia's chart, talk. Um, when you're antiviral, you're type 1. You're promoting your NK cells, your cytotoxic T cells, and it becomes much less of a good antiviral environment when you're type 2. So it makes sense clinical sense that when the type 2 cytokines like this guy goes up, then the, the seesaw of the immune system is down on the antiviral side and up on the um, make these types of antibodies and antibody-mediated things. This is really noisy. I didn't mean to do it to you, but since everybody else did, I don't feel bad. The, uh, 
Look at all the things in yellow are um, the things that mattered that would look like good biomarkers. And there were lots of them. There was a science um, art paper that came out last week, or not last paper, it was letters to the editor in response to Judy's the WPI thing. And there was these four letters, and there, I was getting completely out of the XMRV thing. I was just upset by the letters because they said, well, then no one's found anything yet that's consistent in immunology. No one's found anything yet that's consistent in anything. And I'm like, what? You know, is it like your hand, head's in the sand? I mean, these papers are coming out, bam, 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 big papers saying, yes, there it is. All of the pro-inflammatory cytokines made good biomarkers, all of them. They were all elevated. The type 2 cytokines made good biomarkers. It was very interesting. Um, the the um, natural killer cell, things that would promote natural killer cell function went in the wrong direction. So, so the consistent picture is there, and they made good biomarkers. Now, when you put it all together mathematically and try to come up with the best, best thing, the best thing is combinations. It's when you do these little, you know, when you do your sensitivity and specificity, what captures the, everybody the best and has the fewest false positives in there, um, then you do little combinations. But there's some darn good correlates in these charts. Now, when we do... Um, a genomics thing, or actually say, when we do our math thing and try to understand the networks and how these things work, this is networking, and this is looking at cytokine patterns. This is actually a published thing as well. And healthy controls all clustered in together here, and the chronic fatigue patients in black there all went somewhere else. So cytokines right away pulled the two populations apart. And then when you looked at how things network, how well these guys communicate or link to one another, the linkages just fall apart in chronic fatigue, and they, they become very pro-inflammatory, and the um, things that would promote antiviral function just simply fall apart. That's very interesting. Now, we've looked at many other types of things. Like this is uh, activation using flow cytometry. This is an activation marker, CD26. Now, CD26 is really interesting. We, we just found this by accident, but it turned into a really critical, critical um, observation and understanding why some of these linkages happen between the immune system and the autonomic nervous system. Here's the healthy controls. Here's all these activated people, Gulf War and chronic fatigue. Very activated. I mean, twice normal. These are not, not small activation states. But the cells don't work too well. They, they, they just... Even when a cell works, it, one of the things it does is it wants its activation markers to get out there to the surface of the membrane and be even better at being activated. They make more and more receptors. Those receptors themselves have a function. They fall off the membrane, and now they're, they're active substances floating around. In this case, they're enzymes that are cleaving important things that, that have function. But in a broken cell, you can't make as much of this stuff that goes to the surface. So even though it's activated, there's not very much of those activation markers falling off and doing their jobs out there in the, in the serum. So we show this. Here's a normal activated state. You make a whole lot of the CD26 just falls off, and now it's an enzyme that's got a job. A resting cell doesn't have any. A normal has a lot. But here's an ME patient with just a few, and just a few falling off. So what's happening out here in the, in the body, because this stuff was important, there's a lot less of it over here during that important function. That important function is um, involved in, in a number of different kinds of things. And that, which is, you know, this is showing the CD26, soluble CD26, the receptor that fell off, is actually a pretty darn good biomarker. And it's reduced in uh, chronic fatigue and ME. So here's the activated state. There's a lot of activated cells compared to the normals. But when you look at how much of it, this, these, these little curves, when we look at the bar charts, they're not overlapping very much. So now we've got a, now we've got a biomarker and it's soluble CD26. And then we look at how much they can make per cell, and it's reduced uh, per cell. It's a very nice. And actually, that comes out tomorrow. That's tomorrow's paper, so you'll see that tomorrow. Only tomorrow is almost today, so I really was allowed to say that. <laughs> because that's Miami. And maybe, you know, like in L.A., I'm cool, and I probably didn't break a rule. So <laughs> I don't know. It was close. I, I sat there and said, no, I agonized over those few hours and said, can I say this? But I think I can say this. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, here's this soluble stuff, and it's got a job, and its job is to cleave um, proteins out there, peptides. 
and peptides that are involved in the immune signaling, involved in, in keeping the immune system doing its job ac accurately. But it's also important in cleaving another uh, growth factors, hormones, but it's also involved in, in cleaving a really important thing. Um, there's this thing called neuropeptide Y. Neuropeptide Y is, an, is a, an immune autonomic link, a really important one. It's made by the sympathetic nerve fiber out there in the periphery. And there's a little synapse there, and it's making this stuff. And CD26 is cleaving this stuff. And if CD26 is not there, then there's too much neuropeptide Y. And then neuropeptide Y signals the sympathetic nervous system, go, 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 go. So some of the symptoms that are basically adrenaline-type symptoms would be upped by this immune system problem of not making this important stuff that cleaves neuropeptide Y. It also points to neuropeptide Y as a possible biomarker. So we looked at that. And more neuropeptide Y is really important. It is, like I say, it's sympathetic, so it's involved in cardiorespiratory, central nervous system, has links to the endocrine system, links to the immune system, directly and indirectly. And so we did uh, look at this is an interim analysis, 102 patients in AD controls, and um, you can see the neuropeptide Y is low, and, uh, and that fits with the soluble CD26 finding. Um, this was very interesting, though, and this is the first time we've done this in an analysis. We looked at our SF36, and we had a whole bunch of data because these patients basically came out of a study that had a whole bunch of um, CBT stuff done, so they were measuring a lot of um, profile of mood states and all this, and we're looking at what correlated, and look at these functional things that correlated. The overall health correlated, the, vig the uh, cognitive capacity correlated, the positive attitude scores correlated, in other words, you felt better, had a better attitude, and you could think more clearly if your neuropeptide Y was more in the normal column than the abnormal column. So. <laughs> There are very few biomarkers that correlate well with function. So here comes a biomarker that might correlate with function. So that's very exciting. So let's move on then because I've got a few more things to say. Neuropeptide Y, um, I think, is a promising biomarker. NK cells, I've been talking about NK cells since the first day because that's the very first observation we made back in 1987 about chronic fatigue syndrome was that there was an NK cell functional defect. We haven't moved from that idea. This is an NK cell, by the way, that's attacking a target that the little green guy is piercing this cell. And it has granzymes in it and perforins. Perforins perforate. That was clever of them to name that bat instead of whoever discovered it. So they make little holes and communicate between the two cells. And then the granzymes are enzymes. They get chucked into this cell. And then they blow up that cell. They destroy the cell. And the NK cell releases and goes after another target. Cytotoxic T cells behave just the same way. The difference between them is the cytotoxic T cells know the target they're going for. They're, this one is for, you know, for an Epstein-Barr virus infected cell. And that one's for uh, something else, influenza infected cell or something. And, and with NK cells, they just see things as foreign or self, and they go after things they see as foreign. So they, they recycle around hunting for the stuff. The cytotoxic T cells didn't clean up. And they're both broken. So um, you got this NK cell. It's got receptors that we can measure to say, hey, that's an NK cell. It's got the granzymes inside that, it's, that, um, that um, kill things. And they kill viruses and tumor targets. Sorry, a lot of buttons. So uh, what do you see? Well, in chronic fatigue syndrome, actually, Gulf War was wor the worst. Gulf War, across the board in all my studies, Gulf War has actually been worse than ME chronic fatigue in terms of all of these immune things that we keep finding, though they're the same kinds of findings. They're just worse. The um, chronic fatigue population is about half normal, and the Gulf War was worse than that. And they, there's a... Um, the more um, uh, perforin there is in the cell, the better the cell works. So the, the function of the NK cell, uh, the reason why it doesn't work well is it doesn't have enough of these perforins and granzymes in it. Same thing exactly with the cytotoxic T cell. They both have this defect. We've published that, so I won't spend much time on that. And, it, and is this the exercise thing? Yes, it is. Um, when we... We, we did another thing, you know, here we're looking at good days and bad days, and 
relatively in between days and, and trying to get a sense of good and bad. But we're also looking, we're inducing a relapse in another study where we put someone on a bike for eight minutes and we measure them before at eight minutes and then four hours later. And uh, we're looking at, much like Jonathan, at what genes get turned on or off um, over the course of events. And we just completed that study. It's, we did 35 uh, Gulf War and 35 um, very well-matched controls, and then 35 chronic fatigue-matched controls. So we compare Gulf War to chronic fatigue to, to the control set and put them all on the bike. And then we did these expensive, incredibly expensive gene arrays um, over uh, the three points in time, trying to get a sense of things. And one of our first observations, because we were so focused on the NK cell, was we pulled out the NK cell mechanisms there and sure enough found out that things were regulated quite differently in the Gulf War and the chronic fatigue patients. Um, when you did a, a, an exercise induction and, and what looks like a pretty close gra graph at um, baseline where you couldn't have told, told these people apart by perforin content, when you exercise them, they spread apart and the, the uh, patients were worse. And uh, at the beginning, I could tell them apart by perforin content here um, by, by the genetic perforin content, the, the uh, coding for it, if you would and it spread apart even further with the exercise stress. So that's the concept of dynamic modeling. And I think dynamic modeling is one of the most exciting things out there because if we can understand why you relapse, we can get better treatments for you, you know? And we're not gonna do that with just simple what your blood look like today studies. We're gonna do it by saying, okay, here you are when you feel relatively well, and now I induced a relapse. And so what we're, going, what we're doing now, our next study, unfortunately we're only funded for the Gulf War guys, but we're hoping the NIH will fund the, the, the chronic fatigue part of this, is instead of measuring you at time zero and the peak of exercise and four hours later, we're measuring you at one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute, zip, 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 drying bloods all the way through the exercise, and then quickly thereafter, eight blood draws all together and then trying to put the, the horse before the cart. What happens first? Do the immune uh, things happen and then the autonomic things? Or do the autonomic things happen and then the immune? Because if I'm gonna design a trial for you, I'd like to stop the, the relapse, not treat the symptoms downstream. I'd like to stop it up front. So these are very exciting studies that we're, we're, we're practicing, uh, what we're doing right now. And it's starting from this three point in time study that we already did. We did very, comprehensive evaluations. This is just some, get a sense of it, the talk's way too short to do the whole thing. But at, um, this is comparing peak of exercise, how many genes went the wrong direction um, of 30,000 genes. And in the chronic fatigue, there were 99 genes here that went in the wrong direction that were different than the Gulf War guys who had 611 genes going the wrong direction. And there were some genes that they both shared that went in the wrong direction. But the, um, but now we look at what those genes code for and how they interact and how they interact over time and we get a completely different and more beautiful picture of what's going on. So the easiest thing to do, although I have to say Gordon Broderick, my genius guy at the University of Alberta is doing way better stuff than the traditional way of looking, but the easiest thing to look, look at first is just pathways. What pathways go wrong? And remember, I'm looking at time zero at the peak of exercise and then what happens four hours downstream. And at the peak of exercise, we have pathways that are immune, 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 immune. I mean, there, oops, there's a hormone. But eight of our 10 pathways are immune regulatory pathways. Eight, so the first, at least within 10 minutes, the genes are saying the immune system's being activated in a very strong way, in a pro-inflammatory way. And, and then, um, if you look at, um, this is the same thing again, looking at Gulf War versus chronic fatigue, the Gulf War guys even more so, they're much more impressive. The Gulf War uh, chronic fatigue is the blue, right? Yeah, blue. So there were some things that jump out that the chronic fatigue did more than the Gulf War. But you know, this, these pathways were the same pathways in both groups. And just that there was a lot, even more genes involved and more generalized chaos going on in the Gulf War guys. If you do, and this is not really fair because this is post-challenge, 10 minutes post-challenge, compared to the whole literature of people at rest, not challenged, okay? But if you were to look at what diseases look a lot like this genomically, these are the, the diseases that pop out of that kind of big database. And they're immune, 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 oops, viral, viral. 
You know, there's nothing autonomic or endocrine or anything else in there. This is the, to the 10 minute moment, it's all immune mediated stuff. So four hours later, completely different pathways are invoked. Four hours later, now we have everything under the sun. We have pain pathways, we have autonomic pathways, we have a lot of hormone pathways going on four hours later. So this first, just three points in time study would suggest that the intervention should be an immune intervention or else get at the root cause of what's wrong with the immune system to begin with. But, and if that's in a virus, then great, let's get rid of it. But the, uh, but at least from the genomics point of view, it would suggest immunomodulatory therapies would be the most promising. Um, and then again, these are the pathways involved in what they do, regulation of pain, sensory pathways. Look, nitric oxide, all this stuff you've been hearing today, all these mitochondrial things downstream, all these autonomic things downstream. And it starts to make a very pretty picture, doesn't it? It's just, just like, oh my God, that's, and this is the disease, there it is. And these are the pathways that we invoke time and time again. So it's very exciting stuff. And this is that concept of saying, what, this is Gordon now, Gordon Broderick, my, 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 I keep calling Gordon on tape and things that are videoed, my genius guy from Canada. My genius guy from Canada, <laughs> Gordon's a wonderfully humble guy and he would never let me call him a genius to his face, but he is amazing. So he would do something like this, he calls this a splash effect. Here's the normal person with exercise and here's all this stuff that's not connected at all. And here's IL-1, a single cytokine at the base of this little pathway. And these are all the things IL-1 touches and creates another effect. And then four hours later, the things that that touched to create another effect, what he's calling the splash effect, that IL-1 drove all of that stuff uh, downstream. And so I'm very excited about the concept of using pro-inflammatory cytokines as, as, a, as, a, as the, what do you say, the, the keystone type of uh, uh, concept modeling, uh, clinical modeling. And what we're going to do with our, our eight points in time is something we're calling virtual clinical trials. We're going to model in the computer, individual by individual, what would you have wanted to change and is there something that might have done that? that and, and then do this sort of personalized genomic approach and then, like, like Jonathan, look at the subgroups and how they emerge in terms of interventive approaches based on what we saw with what I think a very elegant way of defining within that individual what genes were involved in their relapses. So I think it's kind of, uh, I just love this stuff. It's so exciting. I, you know, I have to understand that I'm an immunologist and a clinician. I'm not the genomics person. So I've been, I've, you know, I, I'm going to tell you for 25 years I've been faking you all out by talking in other people's languages because I get to hang out with such amazing people and learn so much. But it's, it's what's, what the, the joy of doing this kind of integrative work is learning everyone else's disciplines at least enough to understand what they're talking about. Mostly, I don't talk, understand Gordon all the time. But, the, uh, but it's really, really exciting work. And I think we're closer now than we've ever been to understanding how to go about treating these patients and designing appropriate clinical trials. And I think, in part, biomarker discovery is going to help us because not only does it give us the markers we need to follow, but it also tells us what are the mediators. It points at the mediators within an individual. So, so to conclude, and I have three concluding slides, so bear with me, um, that we have um, a lot of biomarker studies out there. Our, this, I showed you our work, but there's quite a bit, and I couldn't possibly summarize it all in this short period of time. Um, from the very beginning, we've thought NK cell function is good, but NK cell function has its limits in that not every laboratory, it's one of these things that, that degrades over time, and when you ship it overnight, already you've changed the quality of the assay. So it's best in same-day assays, it's acceptable in second-day assays, and it's totally worthless on three-day assays. So setting that up as a standardized method in a lot of different labs is, is not impossible, but it's problematic. Um, it involves a lot of quality control effort. Perforin is a reproducible and easily done by flow cytometry, a method that a lot of laboratories have, and it can be standardized. And we think perforin content as a surrogate for NK cell function is a very good assay. Not only does it measure NK cell function, it measures cytotoxic T cell function, which is horrifically difficult to measure in, in uh, functional assays. So it's lovely because it tells you two different cell types 
and they are the only two cells that deal with viral reactivation in a chronic state. So they are your, they are your surveillance beyond neutralizing antibodies, which doesn't work in every virus and really doesn't work in a lot of retroviruses. Um, if there is a retrovirus, then we have uh, these NK cells and cytotoxic T cells that are, are rather important to the function. Soluble CD26 emerges not only as a potent biomarker that circles the group well, but also as a mediator because soluble CD26 is necessary to modify a number of different important peptides, including neuropeptide Y. And then here comes neuropeptide Y as a very good um, relative improvement over time, but worse or better, uh, biomarker that measures a severity of illness. So that's nice. The cytokine multiplex methods, which have brought the cost of doing this kind of work way down and can do things in groups and clusters like that busy slide I showed you, uh, becomes very nice because you can use um, on the same assay, a cytokine, its receptors, and you can have validation steps on the same assay that, that make you feel very confident. And I will say as a clinical immunologist, when I see very elevated tumor necrosis factor levels and very elevated receptors for TNF, I buy that as evidence that TNF is a potent mediator in this individual's illness. Enough so that in my clinical practice, I would dearly love to circle that group use monoclonal antibody therapy for that group, and I'm designing clinical trials to do just that. IL-1, I think, is a very exciting uh, uh, cytokine as well as a primary mediator, and they may be two different subgroups, so who's driving what um, within the illness to IL-1 versus TNF. Um, still, we're getting very pretty uh, biomarker um, data from very large groups over time uh, that that show that the cytokines are useful uh, as biomarkers in this illness. Uh, genomics offers a tremendous amount. Uh, what what um, you heard uh, Jonathan talk about um, is very exciting. That he got those eight clusters with an N of 100 and something or other, that was very impressive. That, that there's that much consistency that he could use an N of a, with a SNP analysis to find eight groups hanging so tightly together I was, I was very impressed by that data, and, and it's a very exciting kind of technology. And the microarray work we're doing, and uh, there's other things that still need to be done. We need to do methylation to understand more about, um, you know, when you talk about gene work, you talk about the gene, is it there? The gene, is it broken with a SNP, with a mutation? The gene, is it coding or not coding? Is it on or off? When it codes, did it make the right protein? Was there a problem with the protein? Is the protein functional? So there's all these different steps you can use using a genomic method that can really enlighten us as to potential both groups, biomarkers, and interventions aimed at those groups. It's very important work, extremely important, very expensive work, and we're hoping that we get that kind of work funded uh, and uh, can move forward in the field. So. With all of that, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's in a very, very exciting time um, for you as, as patients to be watching this field. When you see us all jazzed up about something exciting like the XMRV and then fighting over it, that's good stuff. That means we're, we're working, you know, and if we disagree, it's okay, we disagree. We're working, we're fighting, we're arguing about method, we're, you know, but we're jazzed, we're working, we're, we're, we're into it. And, and this genomic work is, is very exciting, partly because it's so perfectly amenable to collaboration like nothing else. Genomics is built on the concept that we're going to share our data in the end and be able to do bigger and better comparisons because we all pooled our stuff. And I, Jonathan and I are already doing that. I know that the CDC's left their, their, their all of their data just open to, um, for um, anyone to take a look at. It's a very collaborative atmosphere, and, and that's a wonderful thing. So I'm very excited still after all these years. I'm not totally burned out yet. And uh, <laughs> still working hard. Uh, we're real excited in Miami. We just opened a new clinic, so we're, we're thrilled about uh, doing this kind of work in this integrated way down in Miami. Um, Hannah's here. Hannah, Hannah joined me for all that. And uh, it's, it's an exciting time to translate the science into, into therapeutic intervention. So these are the collaborators. There's a long list. I'm sure I left someone out, but they're not here, so they're not too terribly insulted. Jonathan's off. I'm sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan's a collaborator, too. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much.